what we're going to do is take that talk and formalize it without the student realizing that's what we're doing. <laughs> so this is a kind of game. First, we're not pretending to be children. I'm not looking for you to say, oh, but children will think this, children say that. That's, I'm not interested in that. I'm only interested in what you personally think and say. Right? Secondly, because there are so many of us, we've divided you into four parts, which I think you were told. There's a set of flags which have disappeared down here, making you in two, and a set of flags across there. So there is one group, second group, third group, fourth group. Okay? You'll see why in a minute. What we're going to do is play the game properly, but as we're doing it, you will hear me say, come out of the game. In other words, now I'm going to show you what the teacher is doing that you don't know the teacher is doing. So that I'm showing you how I teach it without telling the student that's what I'm doing. So that you begin to see the kind of subtleties, varieties, what the teacher does without, and this is the key thing, putting my thoughts into your head. What I have to do, because it's my job, in this case, as in the role of the teacher, is to give you words that you do not have and which might help you. This is not giving you words in order to think what I think, but so that you can think more, more profoundly what you think. Extend your vocabulary. <laughs> That's part of the teacher's job. Now, okay. Here was, here's where we're going to break the rule that I would give you. Ideally, we would have read the story yesterday. And then we would reread it again now, before we talk about it. Why do we do that? For this reason. Has it been your experience that someone, as a teacher, gave you a new poem or a piece of music, and having said the, the, the poem, looks at you and says, what do you think that's about? And your heart sinks, doesn't it? We do that to children all the time. This is how to fail. You can, nobody can do that unless they have a certain kind of cleverness. The brain needs time to mull on things. And the more complex and the more rich, the more time it needs. So ideally, in fact, a greater ideal, would have been to read the story last week. Then read it again today. Because in that time, you wouldn't, you would nece not necessarily have thought about it. But in the back of your head, it's mulling away. So that when you hear it again, you think, oh, <laughs> I didn't notice that before. Or, oh, look, yes, that's exactly what I thought. Do you see where I'm going with this? So the reading aloud of it brings us together as a community, shares that experience, and gives us time to think about it before we have to say anything about it. Now, we can't do that today. We, we couldn't do it yesterday, couldn't do it last week, and the story is slightly too long to do it right now. So that's the first mistake I'm making. <laughs> and I'm relying on you having, enough of you having read it already, you may even have talked about it, to have ideas in your head that you can express because it's conscious experience. That's the first thing. Now, this is not a method, but you have to start somewhere. The first time, perhaps the first two or three times you do it with children, you need to follow the sort of pattern that we're just going to do. But after that, you'll discover they know exactly how to play the game without you going through this step. They learn it very quickly. I will show you, as we do it, what they find. So, now, you have to remember your group. This first lot here, up to the flags there, you're going to, in a minute, not yet, think about what you liked about this book, anything at all. The group above the flag here, group two, you're going to think about anything you really didn't like about it. Yeah? 
the third group up here, <laughs> you're going to think about anything that puzzled you, you felt strange, you couldn't understand, okay? And this group, you're going to think about any patterns, any kind of connections, any linkages you saw that help you to make sense of this story, all right? And this is how we're going to do it. Because there's so many of us, I'm going to give you exactly two minutes, two minutes by my clock, to talk to your neighbour if you want to, or to think on your own, and, now this is crucial, so please take this one in. What I'm looking for is not long sentences. Ideally, what I'm looking for is one word that expresses what you want to say you liked, didn't like, puzzled by, or saw as a pattern. Okay? When I've given you that two minutes, <laughs> we're going to start with the likes, dislikes, patterns, uh, puzzles, patterns, to see what we get. And I will show you why we need to do that when we have done it. So, prepare yourselves, and two minutes starting now. Uh, come out of the game. Notice that you didn't want to stop talking. You were finding things, clearly. All right. Now, what is important with this, we're out of the game at the moment, what is important at the beginning is that you write down what the kids say. There are two reasons for this. One is, as soon as the teacher writes down something that a kid says, the kid thinks, my God, this is serious stuff. <laughs> I better think carefully. And secondly, it will be used in a minute to construct what we're going to talk about. This is something we'll come to in a minute. Now, one way of doing this, and I have to do it on the iPad because we haven't got a big screen, you can write up, if you have a big chalkboard, the first column. Sorry, I can't spell. <laughs> I love this iPad, it's lovely. You can do that as the top, but little kids prepare, prefer this. They love that. <laughs> so you're playing it as a game. All right. Now, to get us going, one of our five courageous people <laughs> is going to give us the one thing they liked to start us off. Then I'm coming to this first group, and you'll have to be courageous. Who speaks? Yep, please. Go ahead. Um, I, I like the um, anxiety, the building um, of the anxiety in the book. Ideally, it's one word. She, she said, we're out of the game. She said more, that's fine. But distilled out of that is the one thing she's wanting to say. Now, all right, come on, help me. Who's going to go here? There's a microphone near you. Who will have a go about liking? There, person in red. Uh, you can shout it if you like, and we'll speak it for you. Uh, okay. Er waren hier vertalers. Ik vond het leuk, de herkenbaarheid van de gevoelens. She said she liked the recognition of the feelings. The recognition of the, of the emotion. The emotions, yeah, that's a better word. By the way, I can't spell, so don't worry about it. Um, we need her, so no problem. The kids used to love it that I can't spell. <laughs> uh, someone else, please. Yeah. Surprise. Surprise. There was one here, too, please. Uh, the new words like salad falling. Uh, come out of the game. Notice I don't write up the example she gave. You'll see why in a minute. <laughs> All I want is that one thought. One more from here, then we'll move on. Personality. Personality. I'm going to come to the people who don't like it next. Uh, come out of the game. Look at these words. They're almost all abstract. They're abstractions. Children won't do that. They'll be totally concrete. And the concrete is better. <laughs> it's easier to work with. But you're adult, and of course you speak in abstractions. That's how you've grown. <laughs> so we deal with that. All right. Just let me prepare. 
Um, We dislike. Uh, we're up at the top. Oh, sorry, yes, down at the front, please. Who's going to speak the dislikes? Are you my dear? Go on. I don't really like the pictures. You don't like the pictures. I think she got supporters for that. Uh, <laughs> come out of the game. Come out of the game. You heard the R? That's what we want. Because it means other people think they're wonderful. <laughs> and that's what we want. It's a pity that someone here didn't say that. For the game, can I add it? It's, 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 un, it's not, I shouldn't do it. But can I do it just, just because of time? And I'm very number. sure there's some people in here who like the picture. Yeah, I'm so sure they do, yeah. I know three of them already. Yeah. You'll see why in a minute. All right. Can I have another one, please, from the dislike people? Oh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Albert, in ieder geval. There are two of them. Oh, too many hmm. words. Again, please. Too many words too, to read. Too many words. Ah. Too many notes, Mr. Mozart. Right, next one. Te langdradig, uh, long threaded. <laughs> <laughs> he said it's too long. It too goes long. on and on. On and on Just and on. Wait. Come out of the game. Come out of the game. Come out of the game. He's a boy and he's sitting at the back. <laughs> they, lo they always think they're going to get away with it. But they don't. <laughs> they always think that you can see here more than, you, when, than up there. But in actual fact, you can see more going on up there than here. They don't realize that. <laughs> All right, two, where are we? Too many words. Um, too long, uh, sorry. Right, name, another one, please. The names of the doves. The names, the names of the pigeons. Ah. Names you find them, the them strange? Find them strange. Didn't like them. Yeah, d d d now, uh, come out of the game. I inter oh, my yeah, God. Do, don't interpret her. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Not it. Not to. I think I there. But it's, it's useful because that's the very thing not to do. And it's the most easy thing to yes, do. Yes, it is. And it's a, te a, a teacher's reaction, of course. I was once You sorry. have to restrain yourself because the moment you interpret, you're doing what the whole group is meant to do. And you're more powerful than anyone in the group. You are not equally qualified with them. See the point? You are equally qualified pretty well for this. English is your second language, blah, blah, blah. For me to start interpreting, I am not equally qualified. So I must stay out of it, which allows me to make another point I haven't. It appears from the book that I'm, I'm suggesting that this is the only way you should work. No, no. Remember the business about imitation. All craft work all artwork, is learned by uh, copying those who do it well. Yes? Therefore, <laughs> from time to time, the teacher should demonstrate to the kids how she makes sense of a particular book. So that twice a term, for instance, let's suppose you do one of these book talks three times in the term. They do take a lot of time. That's one thing about them that a lot of teachers get anxious about. How will I have time to do all this? You know, we have infant school teachers with, you know, age five, with teachers who are very good at this. They'll talk for 50 minutes without any trouble at all. Five-year-olds. I can't do that. They're like mice. <laughs> they smell. <laughs> They're all over the place. They sick at both ends. You can't hold an intelligent conversation with them. Until they get about there, I'm hopeless. And this teacher, Miss Hope, Mrs. Hope, now retired, she was phenomenal with five-year-old children looking at a picture book and doing this with them. And the stuff she got out of them was absolutely astonishing because she was that skilled at it. But the way those children grew, we used to get reports from secondary schools saying, which school did these two kids come from? Because they were so far different in the way they tackled their reading than the kids who hadn't had that. And it's an absolute demonstration of how you learn to be a discriminating reader. 
It's not by reading a lot. It is by reading that which is worthwhile and, and thinking carefully about it, but with pleasure. <laughs> now, okay, so we're not going to interpret it. We're having <laughs> one. <laughs> we're having one more. Uh, the ranking. The ranking? Is that what you said? The ranking? Now, um, come out of the game. I haven't a clue what she's talking about. <laughs> but I mustn't say, what do you mean by that? Because I'm not wanting to interpret yet. This is raw material. We're getting the raw material to make something out of. Don't start the interpretation too early. That's like the teacher reading the poem and saying, what is this poem about? <laughs> you haven't got any raw material to work with. <laughs> you don't know how to do it. OK, to move on because of time, can we come to the top group here who are going to tell us anything that they were puzzled about? And we will start here, please. Um, I was puzzled uh, the difference between the text and the pictures. That's a puzzle, <laughs> jigsaw puzzle. So you're puzzled about, please repeat it for me. Um, the connection or the difference between the, the text and the pictures. I couldn't match it at first. Look how I'm doing this because I can't write all of it down. Mm -hmm. But I've got it there to come back to. And I haven't interpreted her, she just said that. Okay, someone from up at the top please, yes, there please. The names of the pigeons. Come out of the game. See what's happened? Is your memory holding it? If it was up on the big board, there it is. See what's happening? Now, if that's displayed on a board where you can see it all, the kids cut onto that and give you more. So showing it so that they can all see it is very important. All right, next one, please. Yeah. He didn't succeed, he failed. And there was another person just behind. The dove's confusion about the humans. I'm doing it like that because I haven't enough space. Uh, give, give me one more, please. Yeah, at the back. The color, the colors of the pictures. The colors of the pictures, is that right? Uh, one more and then we'll move on. <laughs> it will get there. Uh, the, picture of the, the pictures of the people in the, in the pictures. Right, come down to the ones who found the patterns. Who's going to speak from the core group? Yeah, please, uh, hand the microphone. Um, the pattern of the counting down. Again, please. The pattern of the counting down, uh, the doves. The counting down. Yeah. Is that, is that what I write? That's okay. Okay. <laughs> um, I've forgotten the little uh, yeah. icon for that, but patterns do it. My, I'm getting tired. Uh, we might need a sign for it. Yeah. <laughs> who, who will give us one here, please? There are two there. Uh, I would like to say uh, Telemark, because when I read it, I thought Telemark skiing, and that's another way of doing it, like Telemark does. Um, now, why. come out of the game. I'm in a quandary here, <laughs> <laughs> because she hasn't given me a word I can latch on to, so I'm going to have to do something for, for it, all right? I'm going to have to take a step I'd rather not take, but I have to take it. So go back into the game. Can you give me one word for Telemark. what? Telemark. Telemark, thank you. Uh, another one. Humans? Humans. Another one. There. The rhythm. Another one? 
Numbers. Numbers. Any oh. more? Oh. The word oh. Ah. Oh. Oh. <laughs> the grading system. The, the grading system. The grading, the grading system. All right. Now, because of time, because of time, we've got to stop there. But this is what, this is the next point. If the teacher doesn't do what the old teachers did, for instance, with go back to Macbeth. In the second lesson, he said to us, I want us to think about Lady Macbeth. In other words, he was setting the agenda. But if the teacher sets the agenda, it actually implies the interpretation. And here, we're trying to get the demos, the people, to speak about that which matters to them. But the question is, then who should set the agenda? Who will decide what we'll talk about? And this trick is an attempt to avoid that problem and to solve it another way. Now, if we could see all this uh, in one go, you'd see it easily. But I want, what I want you to do is to look at each um, page, each kind, and pick out any word or words that you find repeated on other pages. And you better note it down to remind us. So here we go. Anxiety. Recognition of emotions, surprise, new words, personality, and pictures. Pictures, too many words, too long, names, and ranking. Text and pictures, problem. Names, he failed. Confusion and the humans, uh, uh, confusion about the humans. Colors of the pictures, pictures of the people. Patterns, which had to do with counting down, Telemark, humans, rhythm, numbers, ah, uh, and grading. <laughs> what words occur more than once, preferably two or three times? Which are they? Pictures. Names? Pictures, names, I'm hearing. Pictures, names, humans. Uh, did that appear on more than one? Well... All right. Um, there was rank, ranking and there was grading, so ah, maybe okay. an interpretation wait, 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 might be in the wait, same direction. Wait, 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 wait. wait. Come out That's of the game. That's what I hear. Yeah, yeah. Wait, wait, come out of the game. <laughs> I, now, I now have to ask. You see, at this point, you, you're looking for clarity. And you're looking for deeper thought. Now, what I'm being presented with here, which I should not have been, <laughs> is that ranking is being equated with grades. All right? Now, let's suppose, as it did, in fact, that that came from the demos. And I can't see it there. So this is what I'm going to do. Go back into the, gra into the game. Who gave me the word grades or grading? Who was it that gave me that? Yeah, it's here. Ah, here and here. Um, watch what happens. Can you tell me more of what you mean, or do you not want to do that? Come out of the game. I am not forcing her to do it. I'm giving her the option of saying, no, I just guessed. Guessing is good. In thinking about things, the scientists in the think tanks will tell you the best thinking comes out of guesses. Intuition is what it is. I just have this feeling. Yeah? But I don't want to impose that on her. I want to see if she can say more that clarifies what she means so that we can use it. But I don't want her to force her to do that. So I give her the option. Go back into the game. Can you help us with what you mean about the grading? Yeah, I think uh, the teacher uh, gave, expressed his uh, feelings about the dive. So he... he, he told them what he thought, you know, how, how well they dived. Right, okay, and who gave us rankings? So please, are you prepared to tell us more? It's the same, uh, I should uh, say, uh, just one person 
who uh, is allowed to give those numbers. So are you agreeing with her? Yes, ah, I do. Come out of the game. Do you see what is happening? We're getting explanations of two things that look as though they might not mean the same. And we are getting her, them to agree whether that is what they mean. <laughs> and sometimes you'll find the first one says, no, that's not what I meant. And she will then have to restate what she meant to try and get clearer. That's improving the critical thinking. And they're doing it because they want to. She's got to establish her own meaning. All right? So that we, we're accepting <laughs> that grading and rankings come into this as the same thing. Now, I don't want to pursue more, although we could, because of time. But uh, here's come out of the game. Here's a, here's a, a fact. You've done all this work, <laughs> and it wouldn't actually matter where we started. Any artwork that is worth looking at, you can pick anything out of it, begin talking about it, and the whole thing will begin to unravel. So actually don't get anxious if they don't give you a lot. <laughs> you just want somewhere to start that they say, oh, but miss, the teacher hasn't she hasn't said this, this is us. They feel it's us, and therefore they feel powered, powerful, uh, validated, valued, because that's what all this depends on, feeling confident, valued, and yourself succeeding. All right, so let me just take uh, the... F Can we agree that we will begin uh, here first? All right, with the pictures? Do we? I'm not going to go on till you let me know. <laughs> can we agree on that? Yes. All right. Um, can we have... You see, if this was on the board, it would be so much easier. Sorry. Um... Who was it gave us, it must have been one of the first group, wasn't it? Uh, we need a mic. Um, can you tell us a bit more <laughs> about why you liked the pictures so much? What was it about the pictures? I that didn't like them. You didn't like them? <laughs> oh, I beg your pardon. Can you tell us what you didn't like about them? <laughs> uh, they were very vague yeah. and uh, they didn't match with the text for me. Does, uh, do everybody agree with that? Who doesn't and is prepared to say, uh, I want to get the whole group? Yeah, please. I love them. They were very sweet. So lovely. They were, uh, they were very lovely, the pictures. A little bit old-fashioned, but I like them. Of other people who like the pictures, is that what you felt about them? It is? that they were nice and sweet. What, what does nice and sweet mean? <laughs> can, you, can you help us with that? What, what, do you mean, what do you mean by they were nice? Um, a better word, adorable. Uh-huh. Give um, it in Dutch. The, the tekeningen hadden wat liefs, wat vriendelijks, iets heel zacht. Plastic te vertalen, hè? Ja. She's saying um, she finds them very friendly, sweet, soft, adorable. Right. Uh, come out of the game. All, um, allow me to use this word, all intelligent book reading depends on rereading. If you try to make sense of a text just from first reading, you'll have missed things. So, in academic terms, when you're at university, the, the lecturer makes you reread a book. Now, what we know is that there are two groups of people in the community who are constant rereaders. One is young children, and the other one is professors at, at universities. <laughs> in between, when you're busy with your family, you've hardly got time. I have to tell you, because I can now prove it by myself, that when you get past the age of 60, you'll start doing it again. 
Partly that is out of boredom with what is being published now, <laughs> because you think it's horrible. <laughs> And partly because you're looking at your life and say, you can't help it, it's as though a button is switched on. You start reviewing your life and you start saying, my God, I remember, I will give you an example. I remember when I was 15 reading D.H. Lawrence's Sons and Lovers. That's my epiphany book, as these critics call it. It was the book that identified me. And the day I re finished reading it, I decided I was a writer and I wanted to write that book. And I've been trying ever since and failing. <laughs> After that, I never reread it. Why? Because I was afraid that when I did, I might find it was nowhere near as good as I had thought it was. Until I was 59, when Cambridge University Press published the unexpurgated version. It was published in 1913, and they'd made him take out the rude words. That means sex, of course. <laughs> so Cambridge put it back in the whenever it was, 18, in the 19, uh, 1980s, something like that. So I thought, no, I really must read it to see what they cut out. <laughs> <laughs> it's an even far better book than I knew it was when I was 15. <laughs> and I was so... Believed. <laughs> and I saw things there that I totally missed the first time through because the first time through I was reading it as it being me. The central character was me because his background was exactly mine. Child of a coal mining family, possessive mother, mother determined you weren't going to become a coal miner, he becomes a teacher. Exactly me. Exactly. And it's the only masterpiece of English literature about the deep working class that is a great work of art. No one has surpassed it. It is absolutely superb about the reality of deep working class life, even when I was a child in the 30s and 40s, as to what it was like to be in a mining family and how to get out of that. And he writes it in the most extraordinary English which even in his own day, when it was published in 1913, people recognised. All that out of a boy who in English class terms should never have been able to do it. And I thought this was wonderful. Rereading is where you begin to see what's really there. Now, the point of this is that as our colleague was talking about the pictures, I, and I noticed others of you, went back into the book to look at them. That's exactly what you want to have happen. <laughs> and you don't want to say to them, let's look at this again, because you are then telling them what to do. <laughs> they will do it naturally to see if they agree. All right? Now, um, still out of the game. In my head, I'm saying, this isn't go going to go very far. It's not going to get us to the meaning of this book because we haven't pinned down anything about the pictures which relates to meaning, so I have a problem. <laughs> do I keep pursuing this, or do I not? And this is what I do. Thanks. That's very interesting. Let's go and look at, to see what happens. Uh, I've forgotten where my glasses are. Oh, they're in my hand. Um, <laughs> too many words. Texts and pictures. Rhythm. Oops. Ah, oh, I don't know what that comes into it or not. Let's try that. Um, this is about the words. Uh, who said too many words? Can you say more about that? Uh, when I... Uh uh, looked into the book, I thought, do I have to read all those words? Do we all agree with that? Does anybody think that there weren't enough words? <laughs> or that the words felt just right? Tell me about the words. Yeah. I can agree on that at first time. Uh, when you look at the book, uh, I thought the same, uh, too many words. But when I read it and reread it, I thought, I want more words. 
Do you want more? Yes. Can you tell us why you would want it more? Um, I want to read more about um, Telemark and uh, Tari. Okay. So, <laughs> there is some kind of confusion going on or difficulty here between the words and the pictures because we've got liking the pictures, not liking them. We have too many words and yet second reading, not enough. There's something going on here about the words and the pictures. And I think on the list there is someone who, yes, indeed, it says text and pictures. Who was it said that? I was. Well, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to stick with them. Now, come out of the game. It will often happen, particularly at the beginning, as now, where um, comments are offered by a rather few of the group. And teachers get very anxious about this. They think, oh, there's not enough of them talking. Don't worry. People who listen often take in more than people who talk. So then it's not that they're not doing things. As you do this more and more often, you will find that those people start to say more. The mistake is to start nominating them to speak because they haven't spoken. I have seen a teacher working this approach who had said, oh, Sally, you haven't said anything. Tell us what you think. Yeah. Now, no, 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 no. <laughs> that is for a different kind of lesson. Here, it's let those speak who want to speak. I mean, in Parliament, not all the MPs speak all the time. <laughs> uh, that's true of any group. Those people who are thinking and listening often in the end will have most to say. But here, back in the game, we have this business of the words and the pictures. Names. Who, who mentioned the names? Yeah. Can you say more about that? Okay. Go ahead. No, no there's more than one. Uh, we'll start in company. Yeah. Um, uh, the names were very uh, peculiar. Odd. Odd? Okay. In Dutch, this is the case, is it? I can't do the Dutch. I've only got a translation. So in Dutch, they seem very odd. Yes. You were going to say, someone here was going yes. to say, there, sorry. I also thought they were odd, but I liked it. It made it a little, uh, yeah, fun. It made it fun. The do, names. do these names mean anything? Yes. They do? Yeah. Ah, okay. Come out of the game. It's all right for the teacher to be ignorant. Not to know. And it's useful sometimes to play the game that you don't know when really you do. <laughs> but you don't tell them that. Let's play it that way. Uh, who is it that's speaking? There. I, I don't understand. C can you tell me anything about what these names mean? Why, why are they important in that way? Uh, one dove is called Robo Dove. Yeah. Like a robot. Yeah. Something like that. And uh, a Savoy Dove. Savoy uh, Cabbage, I guess. So, yeah. Well, weird names. Like I didn't, yeah. Uh, uh, microphone, please. Yeah. Telemark, dat is, denk ik, omdat Telemark een plaats in Noorwegen is waar het Ganspringen is ontstaan. She said Telemark is the name of uh, the place where they're skiing in Norway. Right. So that's. Um, that, that can be the reason come why out of the game. is Telemark. Come out of the game. When, you, when you've got this word Telemark, I had a totally different reading of it. Uh, and sometimes, as you progress, as the meaning is being made, the teacher can jump in with something that has occurred to the teacher. And in this case, I can give it to you, so go back into the game. When I read Telemark, what I remember of Telemark is that they, uh, there was a heavy water plant in the Second World War, Hitler was developing heavy water to make atom bombs with, and uh, the um, Norwegian resistance blew it up with the British help. And I thought, why is this character called Telemark? Uh, is it going to blow up? Is it making heavy water? What is it? <laughs> but you're thinking of the skiing. Yeah, yeah. And when you look at those Norwegian ski slopes, God, they're frightening. Have you seen? They are hugely frightening. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mentioned the name Telemark. Yeah. If I were thinking, when you do Telemark skiing, you do 
work with lifting up your leg and in a total different way than uh, parallel skiing. And Telemark is doing the diving in a total different way. So that's what I thought. Oh, good uh, chosen name. So <laughs> it's a way of skiing, Telemark skiing with one leg up. Leg up. And, and bending your knees. Beautiful. Come out of the game. <laughs> Come out of the game. You have just seen demonstrated what I told you early on would happen. That in any group of people, 12, 20, someone will come up with a piece of information based upon their experience, which none of the rest of us had. And by giving us that, she has expanded the possibility of what we can think. In other words, um, let's pursue that. Does this business of skiing in that particular way <laughs> indicate something about what is going on? Yeah. What does it indicate then? It's uh, we got a mic? It's not the skiing itself. No, go ahead. It's not the skiing itself, it's the landing. It's the landing. So the way Telemark is landing, yeah. it's the way the Norwegian skiers at first <laughs> were landing. So but he, what does that they made so a different... Um, kind of landing. But what does that say about the story? Well, his landing was the new way of um, the, the, for the doves to do a dive and ah. land in the salad. Ah, okay. Now, um, come out of the game. Just hang on. Yeah, we don't have long. We don't have long. So, we're going to have to make a jump. What we're getting here is the construction of a meaning, isn't it? We're beginning to decide what this story means, yeah. aren't we? Based just on these names. Not on the pictures, which we had difficulty with and couldn't resolve, but on these names. Now, as the teacher, <laughs> what does the teacher do? Contribute knowledge. I can tell you that almost every writer I know of says how important it is to get the right names in the story. I spend days getting the right names. They have to mean something. They can't just be a nice name. So that, uh, to give you an example, in um, This Is All, my big fat 800-page book. <laughs> it's easier to write 800 pages than to read them. The girl is called Cordelia. Yeah? Some people, some youngsters write to me saying, why is she called Cordelia? Some have spotted it because they're in sixth form at school reading English literature and they're getting the play King Lear. Cordelia is the great lost daughter of English literature. Do you remember the story? Tell me. No, you don't, or you'd have said yes. In King Lear, the old king decides virtually he's going to retire. He has three daughters. He's going to divide the kingdom up between the three of them and he says to them at the beginning of the play, tell me how much you love me, and the one who loves me the most will get the best share. He begins with one, and then the other, and then he comes to the youngest, Cordelia, who is his favorite daughter. And she says, nothing. And he says, nothing will come of nothing. Speak again. And she says, how can I say that I love you Best of all, I'm about to marry my husband, who you wish me to marry. He's a Frenchman, I get his territory. Um, how can I love my husband while loving you best of all? I can't do that. And he banishes her. And he gives the division of the two parts to his other daughters who become horrible, absolutely horrible. It's one of those stories about nobody wants to look after the old parent when they've got senile. And the modern problem. <laughs> I'm entering it already. <laughs> Senility worries me. <laughs> At the end of the play, she comes back and he recognizes the mistake he made. And at that point, the two sisters get hold of her and kill her. And he descends into utter, horrible, mad, death out of grief. The last scene with her is one of the most beautiful scenes in English literature. 
where he says, we too, they're going to put them in a cage, lock them up. We too will be like birds in a cage and we will sing. <laughs> yeah? And then they kill her. Now, she's the great lost daughter. I have no children. If I had children, I would want a daughter. By the time I wrote that book, I was 65 going to 70. And I was trying to find the name for the girl in the story. And oddly, it was sitting in an aeroplane to come here one day. And I was thinking, what is this name? What is this name? And I suddenly thought, I have no daughter. This is a story 800 pages long, as it will be about a girl who is the daughter of the father, the mother has died. This is my daughter, the great lost daughter, whose name therefore is bound to be Cordelia, who if you read ahead, you will know how she ends up. Not murdered, but dead. It's right there in the name. You could look at that book, see her name on the first page, and think, that is bound to happen. <laughs> because Cordelia is the great lost daughter of English literature, the only Cordelia I know in English literature that's known famously. <laughs> Names matter. So here it is in this book giving us a meaning. So without me having to give it to you, what then, based on that idea, is the meaning of this story? What's it really saying? Be brave. Try. It's, all, it's good to be wrong. Sorry about the microphones. That's what's holding us up. There's more than one thing to do things. More than one way to do things. Yeah. And, and that's not uh, bad. That, in fact, in this story, therefore, it's good. Yeah. But it's more than that, isn't it? I'm sorry, I'm now pressing you. That you can be yourself and that's good enough. Be yourself doing something yeah. that's actually different from. And do it. Yeah, and do it. Now, I, I will put the words in your mouth now because of time. <laughs> <laughs> it is a way of doing something that is newly a way to do it. No one's thought of it before. Isn't that right? So that it's innovation. <laughs> Based upon a weakness. <laughs> he can't do what the others do. <laughs> so out of pure, is it instinct or how does he come to do it? He does this thing no one has ever done before mm -hmm. and succeeds. Not really. Not really. By accident. Uh, what is the not really? I think he didn't succeed, it just happened to him. Ah, I see he didn't you... know what to do, so he just did nothing. And but then it's going well, but... Is that, tr is that true? It was not his plan. Is that true of the story? Yeah. I have an inkling that it's not. But uh, 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 yeah, when, go. when I read the book and it I finished it, there was one word that pops up, and it was the word serendipity. Yeah. You, you're looking, f ah. you, you want to do something, yeah, yeah. but you end up somewhere else. <laughs> you see where all this is going? Any child can get this. They may not use the word serendipity. They'll have their own words. But then what does the teacher do? The teacher says, look, there's a word for that. It is serendipity. They have learned another wonderful word, big word, <laughs> to make them feel good. And that's what the teacher does, of course. Gives you more vocabulary to say what you mean. Now, we have to stop because of time. Um, uh, bu -bu -bu. Where am I? All that we've done is in there, with this exception, that the teacher should occasionally demonstrate. That's not in the book. So remember, I think what we were saying is if you did a book talk three, three times in a term, you should at, one, at least once, not at the beginning, but at the end, when they've all done this kind of thing, got used to it, say to them one day, look, you know we've been having these book talks, we've been finding out what books mean together, I'm going to show you how I do it on my own. So that they see here the teacher doing it. 
Now, in that case, I would have given them that book, the book I'm going to use a week before. They probably think, oh, he's going to do a book talk on this. <laughs> and the danger is they'll think, oh, no, he's going to do another book talk. <laughs> you don't want to overdo it. But then they were surprising them by saying, look, I'm not going to ask you what you know today. I'm going to show you how I do it. And you will carefully select what you tell them that gives them just a bit more than they have been able to do so far. In other words, you don't show off and <laughs> give them an academic lecture that tells them what James Joyce means in Ulysses. You, you, you take a book of the kind you would give them and just show them. Um, for instance, with this book, when it came, um, the difficulty today was, today was what book to choose. <laughs> The book I would like to use is an English-American book, and, and I thought, that's unfair. It should be a Dutch book. But I, I didn't know the book. You sent me a translation so I could get that. Um, when I saw it, this is first reactions. So this, again, is that phenomenology of just looking. I thought, oh, how big it is. <laughs> I'm going to have to carry it in my luggage. <laughs> and I'm trying to go light. Um, and then I thought, what the hell does that mean? Oh, that's Edward. I know Edward. I don't know Alain. Uh, that's why I stripped in. Uh, oh, I've given... Who did I give the spare copy to? I've given them my translation. Oh, thank you. Can I swap it? Thank you. Um, I stripped in my bits that had been given me so I could read it. Now, who was it said something about the pictures? They didn't like the pictures. There was someone said that. Uh, back there? I found myself feeling they were almost out of focus. That They seemed a bit blurred. And I thought, is that an accident of printing? <laughs> or was it intended? You see, I'm struggling. Then I read the whole thing through, and I got to what we got to just now. This is about following your nose <laughs> when you're apparently failing, and you do something that's totally new, you've succeeded, and you feel good. <laughs> and most people have had something like that happen. Um, then I saw all these little pictures, the things in them, and I couldn't work out what was going on and felt that I'd have to spend a lot of time on it before I could get that. So the next problem was, is this book worth that time? <laughs> it's a value judgment, you see? Um, it was too near to coming here for me to decide that. But I know from what I'm told, <laughs> that lots of you do find that interesting and do get a lot out of it. And I wonder, I'm beginning to wonder whether there is something embedded in the language, the Dutch language, that has to do with those pictures in a way that the English can't. Now, I may be quite wrong. The names come up. When I heard the business of the names, I was wondering what you would say. And one of you said a bit odd and didn't quite like them. Other one said, they're odd, but they're interesting. And I was trying to get from you without forcing the issue, do they have meanings? <laughs> that Cordelia in the story. Do they have meanings in, inhabited in that text? Now, so here is a game I can play with you. We didn't get this far. Just let me check the time. But I want to Mr. do it because it's important. When you get a lot of dissension going on, and there's some doubts. If, if they no, don't, like, don't like it and puzzled people have a lot to say, you can say this. Look, we've got a problem. What we have to decide is whether this author and this illustrator, this picture maker, really know what they're doing and think about it, or do they just put something down and it's just by accident? So the question is, do we really trust these authors, these artists, to know what they're doing? And we're going to vote on it. So I'd make them vote. 
if you like, you can do it. Who thinks you can trust Edward and Alain to know what they're doing, they're conscious of it, they've worked it out? Who believes you can trust them? Thank you. That's almost all of you. <laughs> so this is what you now say. In that case, we are going to have to accept that everything in the book has a purpose. <laughs> no, no ifs or buts. <laughs> We've decided we can trust these people. So we have to struggle with it and find out what they really were doing because they meant it. Please. Is it possible that you trust uh, the writer but not the one who made the picture? Very good question. <laughs> Very good question. But maybe she, she, she read the, yeah, the story and uh, just... I think, uh, 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 I'm not making a comment about this book. What I'm saying in general is that the best picture books I know have a author artist who is the same person. Moi Sendak is the penultimate genius of that. Beatrix Potter, Raymond Briggs, Brian Wildsmith, these are all English, I know. Ted Van Liesacht. Ted is a genius. If Ted was an American writing in English, he would be a billionaire. It is because he's writing in poetic form in Dutch that he's not. But Ted is absolutely extraordinary and is one of the finest picture book makers in the world. He is wonderful. If you get that compiled edition now, look at the first masterpiece. There are three masterpieces. The first one in English is called uh, My Body is Covered in an Elegant Skin. I don't know how that is in Dutch. My bordjes zijn Thank you. bekleed met prachtig... When I, I didn't know Ted uh, well at all when I came across that book and I thought, my God, this is extraordinary. This is quite out of anything I have seen anywhere. It is a brilliant piece of work. And I workshopped that around Holland 10 or 15 years ago and was surprised how little you'd seen there and how much there was for you to find. He is, he is a magnificent true picture book artist. Now let's say about this about the picture book. The picture book which began in the 18th century as a didactic form, that is teaching the kids Latin with a picture to entertain them and to make it clear. The English book is called Orbis Pictus, little book that does that. It then becomes illustrations of stories that are meant to teach you your Bible, religion, how to behave well, <laughs> And then you come in England to Kate Greenaway in the mid-19th century, where for the first time you see someone thinking, these poems and these pictures make a unit. They're not just an illustration, one of the other. They make a whole. And that's the beginning of the picture book as an art form. It is now one of the glories of children's books throughout the world. It is the only art form invented by children's books. Stories existed before them. Illustrated stories be existed before them. Poetry existed before them in simplified forms for children. Novels. But the picture book is totally new, growing out of a didactic educational need to become an art form with its own aesthetics, its own poetics. It can be studied. And here's the interesting thing. You cannot take a picture book and make it digital. You can't make an e-book out of it. It has to be a book because it has to be that size. That's the size that the artist wanted. It has to have the turnover of the page because if we look closely, and it's a, if it's a good book, what is said on the, this page will be developed on the next page with something having happened there. It's called an indeterminacy. What is said here won't simply be followed on there. Something will have happened in the gap that says something that does not get said. That's part of its aesthetics. Now, if you make a digital version of that, that's not how it works. First of all, it's not that size. Second, it can't be held like that. Thirdly, you can't turn the pages as you can in the book. It doesn't have the same smell. This, this, this one smells like baby sick. I don't know why. 
it's, it's the chemical they use on the white paper. American books smell like that. <laughs> English books smell of something else. Thank you. So, if I, if I give you anything from today, apart from all the stuff we've done, think carefully about the picture book. Go to Ted, look at the elegant skin, and think, how is he integrating all this? What is going on between the turn of the page? It's about Holland. It's about being young. It's about loss. It's about success. It's about happiness. It's about sadness. A huge, extraordinary thing, which little children can take in and talk about. And I'm not being silly in its way. It's as good as Shakespeare. It's as good as Picasso. It's as good as Beethoven. It exists at that level. And you should be proud of it. And you should be having it read. It is the terrifying thing that that book is not available as an individual book. And it's only because you're only 15 million people, you have lots and lots of books, and you can't keep them all in print. If I had my way, I would have a canon of Dutch books. I would have us all decide which books should be kept in print, even though they don't sell much. Because they're our great artwork. It would, it's like, you know, Rembrandt in the Rijksmuseum. We wouldn't get rid of him even if only two people a week looked at him. Because he is the Beethoven of paint. And he's Dutch. Of course he wouldn't get rid of him. I think that's true of Ted. I think it's true of Wim. Uh, I think, yeah, um, there are others. Joke van Leeuwen is, is getting towards that. Um, I'm not sure where your poetry is. The English are thriving in that. We, we always have. I'm not sure where your children's poetry is, but that needs looking at. But if you want an interesting study, think about the aesthetics of the picture book. It's just an extraordinary form. And it's got to be in book form. It's got to be like that. It will go along with the digital because it's different. And it's about being a book. Thank you for listening so much. It's been lovely to talk to you. Thank you for working so hard. I know it hasn't been easy. Thank you. Big round of applause. Thank you very much.